Hello, everyone. Nice to uh, for you to be here again. Um, this week, I'm going to build on the presentation that I made last week. Last week, we talked specifically about international human rights law and learned uh, a bit about the United Nations treaties. And this week, we're going to look into these treaty bodies and their reporting processes um, individual complaint procedures, and also look at some Human Rights Council mechanisms, specifically the special procedures and the Universal Periodic Review. And in particular, I'm going to be talking about how civil society, so you yourself, uh, can be involved in these mechanisms. So this was a slide that you saw last week. Um, and so this week, we're going to specifically focus on the human rights mechanisms of the United Nations. So moving on from that more general slide about the United Nations, this shows more specifically the human rights mechanisms. So as you can see here, the General Assembly adopts human rights treaties. And these human rights treaties have their own treaty bodies. And these treaty bodies have their own reporting procedures, and you're also able to submit individual complaints to them. Also, the General Assembly created the Human Rights Council. The Human Rights Council appoints special procedures, and the Universal Periodic Review is also an innovation of the Human Rights Council. And I'm going to discuss these four mechanisms. Also in this table, you'll notice the Secretariat. So the Secretariat of the UN is where the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights sits. And this is where a lot of the staff supporting these different uh, procedures are. Things don't have rights. People do. For example, we have the right to education, to express ourselves freely, to be protected from violence. These rights are written down in international treaties. Governments sign up to these treaties on behalf of their people. There are 10 core treaties protecting people's rights. Some focus on children, women, persons with disabilities, migrant workers. By signing these treaties, your government promises to respect these rights. Governments don't always keep their promises. And it can be difficult for people to check up on their government. So each treaty is monitored by a group of independent experts from all over the world. These experts come together to work in committees called United Nations Human Rights Treaty Bodies. The experts get information from many sources. The government, of course, but also civil society organizations and individuals. The treaty bodies then question governments in detail about their human rights record. They then report their findings and make recommendations for action. bodies also address cases where individuals have suffered a miscarriage of justice. The treaty body's recommendations are made public on the UN Human Rights Office website and social media feeds. If your country has been reviewed, you can use these recommendations to encourage the government to take action. You have the right to claim your rights. Use the treaty body's findings to help you. 
when the treaty bodies question your government about your rights, you can watch the session on this website. Hold your government to account. Make sure they're doing their job. So that was a brief introduction to the treaty bodies and their mechanisms. But simply, when a state ratifies a treaty, it has a legal obligation to implement the rights recognised in that treaty. Also, in addition to their obligation to implement the rights of the treaty, each state party is under an obligation to submit reports to the relevant treaty body on how the rights are being implemented and this occurs approximately every eight years. And I'm now going to go into uh, detail about the treaty body reporting process and how civil society can be involved in this process. So this diagram here shows uh, the recurring cycle of a treaty body process. So step one is what's called the list of issues prior to reporting or LOIPA. So all the treaty bodies present a list of issues and questions to the state under review prior to the session. The LOIPA are a set of questions about specific human rights issues relevant to that particular state. And it helps the state to prepare for their review. It often builds on previous reviews and will raise issues that were concerns in previous reviews. So the aim of this is to provide uh, more of a streamlined reporting process. So but it removed the need for states to then submit a report and then also respond to a list of issues and questions. Importantly, you can have a say on what you think should be in the list of issues prior to reporting. So you can submit what you think are issues and possible questions that should be sent to the state. So you can send this to the committee itself. The committees have their own deadlines, but most require about three months before they themselves are going to issue the list of issues prior to reporting. Importantly, you can see all the deadlines on the OHCHR website. The state will submit its response to the list of issues. And this is known as the state report. It is best practice for a state to consult with civil society about its report. And so you can be involved in this way. But importantly, civil society can also submit their own reports. These are known as alternate or shadow reports. So a shadow report shadows the state report. Or an alternate report will bring up other issues or topics that civil society society considers relevant. So all these reports should include objective and evidence-based information on the national context and can include information about implementation of previous recommendations, areas that you think are concerning, comments on national legislation or policies or programs. It's also very useful to include disaggregated data and statistics if you have it. Also, emblematic cases are very useful. You can also uh, include suggested concluding observations and recommendations. So you can include in there what you think the state should be doing and say, make this a recommendation. Uh, each treaty body has its own templates and limits and suggestions for writing these reports. They also have their own deadlines. All of this information is available on the OHCHR website. So if you are interested in a specific treaty, you should go onto the OHCHR website and look for that treaty in that treaty body. Step three is the review itself. So this usually occurs uh, in Palais Wilson in Geneva, Switzerland. And this is a dialogue between the committee and the state representatives. The dialogue is meant to be constructive with the state acknowledging issues, explaining steps they are taking to try and resolve these issues 
and then the committee discussing the steps that have been taken and other possible steps. Civil society can attend, observe and speak at the sessions. Importantly, from my experience with the New Zealand Human Rights Commission, I know that it was very useful to attend and then advocate with treaty body members, perhaps at side events or when you were having coffee in a break and often you could have very useful conversations during those times. In order to participate in a treaty body session, you need to register with the secretariat of that treaty body in advance. Again, information is available on the OHCHR website. I know that traveling to Geneva can be very hard. So it is also possible to participate uh, online. And again, you can contact the Treaty Body Secretariat to arrange doing this. Uh, I have done this uh, from New Zealand as it's uh, very long to fly and very expensive. And so we arranged uh, for a number of civil society organizations to get together in New Zealand and then they were able to engage with the committee online during this review. Also, the reviews are showing live on the UN webcast TV, and so you can also watch the review live. After the dialogue, the treaty body issues concluding observations uh, and recommendations to the state party. So these concluding observations normally in include acknowledgement of positive steps taken by the state, identification of problem areas, and then steps that the state can take to rectify these. And they do include specific recommendations on steps that should be taken. And while the review part may be over, the recommendations should be implemented. And you can encourage the implementation of recommendations, uh, including through working with government and continuing to advocate for the implementation of these recommendations. And then while this official uh, cycle of the treaty body review is over, uh, the review continues into the next cycle and then will go on to the next list of issues prior to reporting. So uh, from what I've seen, Kyrgyzstan actively does take part in these reviews. So for example, the Human Rights Committee held its third review of Kyrgyzstan in October 2022. And they got concluding observations and recommendations about investigating acts of corruption, adopting comprehensive anti-discrimination legislation, and to guarantee the independence of lawyers. And this is a photo from this review that I took from the OHCHR website where you can still watch uh, the review if you would like. Uh, importantly to note, Kyrgyzstan submitted uh, its report to the Committee on the Rights of the Child in November 2019, but their review is scheduled for this month. So this month, uh, Kyrgyzstan should be appearing before the Committee on the Rights of the Child. Uh, I'm now going to move on to the other mechanism of treaty bodies, and that is individual communication procedures. So the cleaning procedures allow an individual to bring a complaint against the government alleging a violation of their treaty rights. The complaint is then considered by the relevant UN treaty body. The body adopts a decision, including recommendations to the state. So this is a way of encouraging or obliging a state to take measures to rectify or compensate an individual whose human rights are being violated. Today, I'm going to explain the process and in future webinars, I'm going to touch on specific decisions. So this video here that you're about to play shows a positive change that happens following an individual complaint. Pues antes, cuando yo no iba al colegio, me notaba un bicho raro, obviamente, porque las niñas iban y yo no.
undeniably a right for every child, regardless of their citizenship status. Pero algo quizá de estudiar, porque me gusta muchísimo estudiar, y además me gusta sacar buenas notas. Children and those working with and for children can bring problems to the community. It's the final destination when they've been searching for an answer to a child's rights violation. Cada, cada jueves yo vamos a recoger firmas, pidiendo firmas, por la colección de los niños, y mucha gente estaba de acuerdo con nosotros y nos daba sus firmas, su nombre y apellido. Y los viernes yo vamos a, a cantar canciones, inventar cuentos, inventar canciones, muchísimas cosas, desde la 1 hasta las 12 menos cuarto, estábamos ahí. Ended up with their lawyer suggesting that they come to the Committee on the Rights of the Child by filing a communication with us. It obviously is a complaint against us. So we have to give the state a chance to be able to respond to what has been asked. Uh, Llevamos dos años y dos meses luchando. The committee requested the Spanish government to do this and they complied. I think what is really interesting about this case, positive about it, is that it only took a few months from when the case was filed with the committee to the child being notified that she would be given access to school. And so this really shows how we can make rights real. Como me había escolarizado a mí, hay que escolarizar a muchísimos niños más para que estén contentos como yo. A mí siempre me ha gustado ser abogada, en plan, abogada la que lucha por el derecho de los niños como muchas personas. Y antes tenía la puerta todas cerradas y ahora, como me dio en colegio, pues ya las tengo abiertas y puede, en plan, si estudio mucho, puede ser abogada. Hola, señor, de Comité de Derecho de Niño. Quiero dar la gracia a vosotros, que he luchado por mi hija. Ahora está escolarizada. Estoy, claro, estoy contenta y estoy tranquila que mi niña, por lo menos, que está tomando la tarea. Ahora se ha abierto la puerta para el futuro, para que mi hija pueda conseguir muchas cosas en su futuro. No va a ser así perdida. Ha abierto la puerta, de verdad. Y muchísimas gracias por todo. So that was a very positive example of a complaint against Spain that a young girl who was not a citizen of Spain but resided in Spain was unable to attend school. And then following this complaint being filed, uh, Spain allowed her to attend school. So these individual complaints really can have a positive effect. And so now I'm going to discuss how you can lay these complaints. Pues. So, as I mentioned, human rights treaties place obligations on states to uphold the human rights in these treaties. Uh, unfortunately, not all treaty bodies have individual complaint procedures. So the ones in which you can lay a complaint are the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, the Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel, Inhuman or Degrading Treatment or Punishment, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. And I've also listed here the Convention on the Protection of the Rights of All Migrant Workers and Members of Their Family. So they have a complaints mechanism, but it isn't operational yet. So for this convention, you can't lay complaints yet. So if you think your son has breached a human right in one of these treaties, you could complain about it to the relevant committee. However, it is important to know that you must have exhausted domestic remedies. So what this means is that before you make a complaint to a committee, you must have tried to resolve your complaint in Kyrgyzstan. And this is what's known as exhaustion of domestic remedies. So, for example, you must have raised your complaint with the relevant national authorities and they must have declined to hear it or not found in your favour. Or if you have taken your court case to the highest court and, again, they haven't found in your favour or nothing has been done. Essentially, you must have tried to resolve the matter in your country. However, it's also good to know 
that you're not required to exhaust domestic remedies where none exist or the process or procedure is incredibly delayed or the procedure isn't fair, you can tell this to the committee and they will consider that also exhausting domestic remedies. So to discuss what information goes in a complaint, I've put an example here of a contents page of a complaint to the Human Rights Committee uh, against the Maldives. And this alleged that the Maldives had violated the right to freedom of expression. So the people who filed this complaint were human rights commissioners in the Maldives. And they were prosecuted by their Supreme Court on charges of treason for submitting data to the United Nations about the lack of independence of the judiciary. Uh, so this was their complaint. Uh, if you are interested in submitting a complaint, there are model complaint forms online on the OHCR websites and templates that you can use. It's not necessary to use these forms, but it does make sure all the necessary information is included. So the necessary information includes things like information of the complainant and their contact details, uh, information of the victim if someone else is complaining on behalf of the victim whether these names need to be made anonymous. So you can ask uh, that the, the names are not given if you're fearful of safety. Uh, you need to include information about the exhaustion of domestic remedies, which I just discussed, uh, a summary of the main facts, what rights you consider have been violated and how they have been violated, and then what remedies you would like to obtain. It's often useful to attach supporting documents. So for example, decisions of local courts or medical reports. Uh, so you, there are also restrictions around complaints around page length. So it can't be longer than 50 pages and it must be in one of the six UN languages of which Russian is one. So what happens to a complaint? So firstly, a complaint is registered. So once it's sent, it's received uh, by the committee secretariat and it will be determined whether the com uh, whether domestic remedies have been exhausted, that there's information uh, that the state is a party to that treaty and that that complaint is not manifestly ill-founded. So at the moment, they're just assessing whether all the information is there and that the committee should look into it. And then if these requirements are met, the complaint is then registered. Once it's registered, the state is given a chance to respond. So uh, the information is sent to the state and they are asked to respond within a time frame of six months. Once they do respond, the complainant is also then given a chance to respond to what the state has said. And then once the committee has all this information, they will consider the complaint itself. It's also good to note that if the state doesn't respond, even after it's been sent reminders, the complaint can still proceed and the committee can still consider it. So firstly, the committee considers admissibility. So what this means is that whether it meets the legal requirements. So the requirements uh, include things like, is the victim a victim of a human rights violation? And is this human rights violation caused by the state? Is this human rights violation a right that is in the treaty? Is the state a party to this treaty? does the information show a human rights violation? And has the matter been submitted to another international mechanism? So for example, in Europe, if a complaint is submitted to the European Court of Human Rights, it can then not be considered by a UN treaty body. Once a complaint is considered admissible, uh, the, the committee will consider the merits and often to save time, Steps three and four can take 
uh, place at the same time. So the treaty body will then consider the merits of the case, meaning the body will consider whether or not a violation has occurred. And this will be determined looking uh, at the facts submitted by the state and by the complainant. Usually the complainant and the state do not attend. And uh, this is done in a closed session. However, sometimes it can be held in an open session if this is requested although this is not common. Uh, so if you do want a complaint to be considered in the open, uh, you might consider requesting this. So step five is a decision. So the treaty body will reach a decision on whether a human rights violation has occurred. And this decision will be sent to the complainant and the state. If it finds a violation has not occurred, then the procedure is finished and this decision cannot be appealed. Uh, it's useful to note that all decisions can be found on the OHCHR jurisprudence database available online. And this is a very useful database where you can filter by different human rights issues, uh, different states uh, and treaty bodies. Uh, so if you are looking for previous decisions that would be useful, this is a very helpful website. Uh, lastly, step six is follow-up. So if a violation is found, the state is asked to provide information on the steps it will take to rectify or compensate for this violation. And it is asked to provide this information within 180 days. Once this information is received, it is sent to the complainant. There are follow-up procedures, but each treaty body has their own follow-up procedure. But they will continue to follow up with the state until they consider that this uh, complaint has been sufficiently dealt with. Also, along the side here, you will see some red bars of some processes that could take part throughout uh, the process. So interim measures is one of these special steps. So at any point during the complaints procedure, the treaty body could issue a request to the state for interim measures. These interim measures are used to prevent irreparable harm. So often they're used in cases such as where someone is facing deportation or the death penalty. And the interim measure will ask the state not to carry out these acts until uh, a decision has been issued. The other special step is friendly settlement. So some treaty bodies allow for friendly settlement. So if the complainant and the state come to an agreement by themselves, the complaint is considered to have been settled in this process of uh, the treaty body considering the complaint or not. Yeah. So I hope that gives a very quick overview of the process. So I thought I'd briefly talk about uh, individual complaints against Kyrgyzstan. So there have been 28 individual complaints against Kyrgyzstan uh, that have been considered by the Human Rights Committee. So that's the committee that monitors the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Two complaints were found to be inadmissible. Uh, and of the remaining 26, a violation was found in 25 and not found in one. The large majority of these cases concerned issues such as fair trial rights, arbitrary detention, torture, and prompt and impartial investigations. So from what I can find, it appears that Kyrgyzstan hasn't taken any substantive measures or implemented recommendations of the Human Rights Committee and that the Human Rights Committee continues to follow up on these cases. Uh, there has been one individual communication against Kyrgyzstan to the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. And in this case, the committee found that Kyrgyzstan had violated the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women by violating the rights of a woman in prison, including that detention facilities did not address specific needs of women, 
that women in prison were supervised by male guards, that male guards disrespected the victim, including through inappropriate touching and unjustified interference with her privacy. So following the adoption of views by the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, a Bishkek court ordered compensation. However, this compensation was lower than what the complainant sought. And I understand she has indicated that she intends to appeal this decision. So that uh, is a very quick overview of the two mechanisms uh, that you could be involved in regarding the human rights treaty bodies. And now I'm going to move on to the mechanisms of the United Nations Human Rights Council. So firstly, the Universal Peric Review, or the UPR as it is commonly called, is a human rights council process where each country is reviewed on their human rights by other countries. So states give recommendations to other states on how to improve their human rights situation. Each country is reviewed approximately every five years, and each five years is called a UPR cycle. We're currently in the fourth cycle, and the process is cyclical. So each review takes into account and builds on the recommendations of previous reviews. And here is a quick video illustrating the UPR process. The Universal Periodic Review is a unique mechanism of the United Nations. This mechanism aims at improving the human rights situation in each of the 193 UN member states. The UPR is a five-year cycle process comprised of three key stages. First, the review in Geneva of the human rights situation in the state under review. Second, the implementation between two reviews of recommendations made to the state under review. Third, the assessment at the next review of the implementation of those recommendations and the developments of the human rights situation in the country since the previous review. Three main documents underpin each review. A national report written by the state under review. In this context, the state is encouraged to conduct national consultations with national civil society in order to reflect their concerns and to comprehensively assess the domestic human rights situation. A compilation by the Office of the High Commission of Human Rights of information from treaty bodies, special procedures and UN agencies. A summary drafted by the OHCHR based on the information received from national institutions and CSOs. The review in Geneva consists of three steps. First, the state is reviewed during three and a half hours by a working group comprising all UN member and observer states. These states make recommendations on how to improve the human rights situation in the state under review. This exercise results in a draft report containing, on average, 200 recommendations. Second, the draft report is adopted by the working group a few days after the review. Third, the draft report is formally adopted at the Human Rights Council a few months later. At this stage, the state on review must declare which recommendations are supported and which are noted. The UPR is a truly universal process as it reviews all UN member states and takes into consideration all human rights, from civil and political rights to economic, social and cultural rights, regardless of the size or human rights situation in a given state. At the UPR, states are reviewed by states. Nonetheless, civil society, national institutions, the media and the citizens have a great role to play. They can provide information before the review of their states and assess and support the implementation of recommendations. So that was a brief introduction to the UPR and I'm now going to talk specifically uh, about each individual step and how you could be involved. 
So the first step in a review is here in grey and is the preparation of pre-session documents. So the review itself is based on three documents. Firstly, a report prepared by the state known as the National Report. The National Report should give an update on progress of previous recommendations and any new or emerging human rights challenges. States are encouraged to consult with stakeholders within their country when preparing the national report. So you can take advantage of any opportunity to be involved in the preparation of the national report. Kyrgyzstan's fourth national report is due in February, 2025. So perhaps over the next year or two, uh, you will be able to take part in Kyrgyzstan's national report. The second document, is a report compiled by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. And this is called the Compilation of UN Information. This report compiles information from UN treaty bodies, special procedures, and other UN bodies. So for example, the compilation of UN information for Kyrgyzstan's third UPR included information from the Special Rapporteur on House Country Visit, uh, information from the UN country team in Kyrgyzstan and concluding observations from the review by the Committee on the Protection of the Rights of All Migrant Workers and Members of Their Family. The third document is a compilation of information from stakeholders that's compiled by OHCHR and this is known as the Summary of Stakeholder Information. So civil society, national human rights institutions and NGOs are encouraged to submit their own reports called stakeholder submissions. These submissions are then compiled into one report by the OAP. So Kyrgyzstan's previous summary of stakeholder information from the third re review included information from Kyrg NGOs such as Burdino, the Coalition Against Torture, and also international organizations such as Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch. Again, the UNOHCHR website provides invaluable advice on content and practical suggestions and formatting. And you can also submit your stakeholder submissions online here. Uh, most are due around six months prior to the UPR session taking place. Also important to note that UPR pre-sessions are held by the NGO UPR Info. So approximately one month before the UPR review itself, UPR Info arranges a meeting in Geneva, Switzerland. So interested organizations and permanent missions in Geneva are invited. So at this session, the interested organizations present on human rights issues in the country and what they think recommendations could be. So representatives from the permanent missions can ask questions. So as it is states that give these re recommendations, uh, it is these representatives who will be giving the recommendations. So this is uh, a great initiative in order to engage more with these people who are going to make these recommendations. So prior to Kyrgyzstan's review, UPR Info has scheduled a pre-session for Kyrgyzstan in April 2025, which is something you might like to consider being involved in. However, once again, it can be expensive and hard to get to Geneva. So it's also possible to arrange pre-sessions in your own country. So you could organize a meeting inviting NGOs and civil society uh, and then permanent representatives of the embassies in your country. So, for example, in New Zealand, the Human Rights Commission organised a pre-session in the capital, Wellington, prior to New Zealand's third universal periodic review. And this was very successful in having a dialogue between civil society and embassies that were in New Zealand. So you may like to consider holding your own session in the service. So, following the submission of all these documents, the review itself takes place. So, the reviews are held in the Palais des Nations at the United Nations in Geneva. 
The review is held by a working group comprised by members of the Human Rights Council, so other states. Each review lasts for approximately three hours and comprises one hour where the state presents its report and replies to any questions that have been submitted in advance, and then two hours of an interactive dialogue between all the states. So state representatives will make comments and recommendations to the state being reviewed. On average, each state receives around 200 recommendations. Unfortunately, only UN member states can take the floor during these sessions. However, you might like to consider holding a side event or screening the webcast of Kyrgyzstan's UPR review. So once again, you can view these live on the UN webcast TV. So lastly, is the implementation of recommendations. So states can officially accept, partially accept, or take note of each recommendation. On average, each state accepts nearly 85% of its recommendations. And following the review and its adoption of recommendations, the state is supposed to implement the recommendations. The international community uh, in Geneva and wider can assist in implementing the recommendations. And states are also encouraged, although they are not required to submit midterm reports, explaining their progress in implementing their recommendations. However, Kyrgyzstan hasn't submitted any midterm reports. As you can see, this is a circle, and so the cycle continues, and the next review will focus on the implementation of recommendations on the previous review, and then the cycle continues. So regarding Kyrgyzstan's involvement at the UPR, I've touched on it a bit, but just to note that Kyrgyzstan's third review was held on the 20th of January, 2020, and this is a photo from this review. Their fourth review is scheduled for July or August 2025. Submissions, so these are the civil society submissions, uh, are due on the 26th of September 2024. So this is something you might like to consider being involved in. I'm now going to move on to our last mechanism, which is special procedures. So special procedures is the term used to describe independent human rights experts or groups of experts with mandates to report and advise on human rights from a thematic or country perspective. They are commonly called special rapporteurs, working groups, or independent expert, and they are appointed by the Human Rights Council. There are currently 44 thematic uh, special procedures and 12 special procedures with a country mandate. So for example, they include the special rapporteur on the promotion and protection of human rights in the context of climate change, the special rapporteur on the promotion and protection of the right to freedom of opinion and expression, the special rapporteur on the independence of judges and lawyers, the special rapporteur on the right to privacy, the Working Group on Discrimination Against Women and Girls, and the Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in Afghanistan. So here's a brief of introducing the procedures. When the Human Rights Council decides a rights issue is so important that it needs a specialist investigation, it creates a special procedure. Through special procedures, human rights defenders can draw attention to rights abuses and prompt an expert-led response. Special procedures come in different shapes and sizes. They can be an individual, known as a special rapporteur or independent expert, or a team of experts called working groups. In all cases, these experts are entirely independent. Not controlled by politics, they remain impartial and unbiased. This neutrality allows them to cover issues that might otherwise be deemed too politically sensitive for discussion at the international level. 
Special procedures can have a thematic scope. For example, the Working Group on Enforced Disappearances was created as a reaction to that particular human rights violation and examines the issue in every country around the world. Other special procedures focus on a single country, such as the Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in Cambodia. They embark on country visits, prepare reports, and raise concerns about individual cases or laws. Every year, the experts present their reports to the Human Rights Council. The reports include recommendations to the Council, to individual governments, and to other actors like businesses or NGOs. Special procedures can also issue statements and press releases, thereby increasing scrutiny or awareness of a problem. Special procedures are one of the most powerful international instruments for confronting violations of the rights of individuals and particular groups. In the past, they have taken action against the killing of environmentalists, raised awareness of the challenges facing women human rights defenders, shone a light on abuses against LGBTI people, and helped to expose the risks faced by civil society in highly restrictive environments. So as a mechanism, Special procedures are invaluable to human rights defenders. Their defined scope allows a precise focus on the issue. They are fast, flexible, and public. They can mobilize quickly as situations arise and react as they develop. Finally, they are open and accessible. The cases they raise, the countries they visit, and even the content of their reports are all strongly influenced by information they receive from civil society. As a result, special procedures are one of the most effective tools available to human rights defenders. That was a brief introduction to special procedures and I'm now going to explain a bit more about their role and how you can be involved. So firstly, special procedures undertake country visits. The so country allow the direct observation of the human rights situation. When on a country visit, the special procedure will meet with NGOs, with government and civil society. A country visits usually vary in duration between one and two weeks. Following the visit, the special procedure will prepare a mission report and this contains details of their itinerary, of their meetings, but also contains an analysis of the situation and conclusions and recommendations. There are numerous ways civil society can support the visit of a special rapporteur. So civil society could encourage a special rapporteur to visit their country, and they can do this by writing to the special procedure outline, outlining why they should visit or they could encourage their government to invite a special procedure. If the special procedure does decide to visit, civil society can aid in the preparation of the visit, including by providing advanced information, including who they think they should meet with. Many special procedures will issue a call for information prior to their visit, and you can find these on the CHR website. Also, following the visit, civil society can follow up on the recommendations made by the civil society uh, and advocate for the implementation of these recommendations. Special procedures also have their own communications procedures. So communications could be sent to a particular special procedure alleging a violation of a right. However, it's important to note that special procedures don't have power or authority to enforce their views or their recommendations. So once a communication is sent to a special procedure, the special procedure will decide whether or not to take action. So they'll look at things such as the reliability of the source, uh, the information received, the precision of the factual details, and the relevance of the issues in regards to their mandate as a special procedure. They may then write a letter of allegations. So these letters include their concerns and a request to the government to provide further information. 
such as whether, uh, whether measures have been taken to investigate and punish the alleged perpetrators and steps taken to avoid the recurrence of such violations. Governments are usually requested to provide this response within two months. Uh, in appropriate situations, such as situations of grave human rights violations or where a government has repeatedly failed to respond, a uh, special procedure uh, may make this public uh, and may, for example, issue a press release or uh, hold a press conference. So civil society play a very large role in these communications by alerting the special procedures. Anyone can submit information to a special procedure, and this can be done from wherever you are. You don't have to travel to Geneva. So if you want to submit uh, a complaint or a communication to a special procedure, the first step is to choose which special procedure or procedures. So you need to make sure that their mandate is relevant to what you're saying is the human rights violation. You then need to collect all relevant information and this could include first-hand reports. It should not just be based solely on media reports. And then you could submit this information through an online portal, uh, again, at the OHCHR website. Uh, so this is a, a little bit similar to the treaty body uh, communication procedure, but here this is much faster, but it also doesn't have a specific uh, follow-up uh, procedure or any sort of legally binding requirements, but it's also a useful process that you might like to consider using. Special procedures uh, also undertake thematic studies and they will present their studies at the Human Rights Council and at the General Assembly. So these here are some examples of past reports. Uh, and as some examples, the independent experts on human rights and international solidarity uh, had a report about international solidarity and aid of the realization of human rights uh, during and after the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, there have been reports about the interrelations between the right to education and the rights to water and sanitation uh, on the impacts of climate change and climate finance on Indigenous people's rights uh, and about violence against women journalists. To aid in their preparation of these reports, special procedures might ask for information, um, which you can submit to. And once again, these are on the OHCHR website. So for example, right now, the Special Rapporteur on Racial Discrimination has called for written submissions for her report about discrimination by neo-Nazis in skinhead groups. So you can keep an eye out on the OHCHR website if you need special procedure is calling for information on something that you want. Uh, one of the big responsibilities for special procedures is engaging in advocacy and raising public awareness. Each special procedure will advocate in their own way and what they are comfortable doing. Some engage with traditional media, for example, through press releases and press conferences, uh, some uh, are quite, use Twitter quite a lot. Uh, they can also organize their own events and side events uh, in which you can see an invitation here. Special uh, procedures may also organize their own communications campaigns. So for example, the Special Rapporteur on the Human Right to Safe Drinking Water and Sanitation conducted a campaign celebrating the 10 year anniversary about General Assembly and Human Rights Council resolu resolutions uh, that created the human right to water and sanitation. You might like to encourage a special procedure to raise awareness about an issue or violation. That special procedure may then tweet, release a statement or issue a press release about the issue. Uh, for example, the special procedure on the right to housing 
often tweets about reports and allegations that she has received. So regarding special procedures in Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyzstan has issued a standing invitation to special procedures. So a standing invitation means that the state will accept a visit from any special procedure at any time. That a special procedure doesn't necessarily have to be invited by the government. So again, you could use this to your advantage by encouraging a special procedure where you think there is an issue to visit Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan has already been visited by many special procedures and has cooperated with them during their visits. So for example, Kyrgyzstan was visited by the Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights in 2022, and both the Special Rapporteur on Minority Issues and the Working Group on Enforced or Voluntary Disappearances in 2019. Uh, and this here is a tweet from the Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights uh, during her visit, uh, talking about uh, the meetings that she was going to have that day during her visit. So that's the last mechanism I'm going to touch on. Uh, it's been very brief uh, in touching on the four mechanisms of treaty body reporting, uh, individual communications to treaty bodies, the universal periodic review, and special procedures. And I've touched upon how you can be involved in all of them. Uh, hopefully that's given you a good overview of those four processes. Uh, and perhaps you have some, some questions uh, I'm happy to answer. And also, as I've mentioned throughout my presentation, uh, the website of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights is an incredibly useful resource if you would like to be involved in any of these four procedures.